are those interested in science, who eventually become convinced that a spirit exists in the laws of the universe, a spirit vastly superior to that of man. In the face of such a spirit, we, with our modest powers, must feel humble. In this way, science leads to a religious feeling of a very special sort, born not of superstition, but of grace. soulful eyes see. Who was Albert Einstein? And what's he doing in a place like this? Welcome to the Cosmic Fuel Pump, where each week we probe beneath the world of appearances to see what matters more, who we are, what we're all doing here, and to really get to be able to do a better job at life. Well, so too with Albert Einstein, who saw more deeply into the mystery, perhaps than anybody before him. It's a great pleasure for me to have on my show today to talk about this new view of reality that we've been graced with ever since Einstein, an Einstein expert. The noted actor who's been doing a one-man Einstein show, my friend, Ed Metzger. Hi there, Ed. Hi, Suzanne. <laughs> I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Good. I, I want you to start out by telling the audience why you call your show Albert Einstein, the practical bohemian. I mean, what was bohemian about Einstein? Well, uh, it was a nickname given to him by the students at Princeton University. Uh, they loved the way he dressed, his demeanor, his philosophy, and so they thought the practical bohemian was a suitable name. Practical, which by the way, Einstein loved the name too. He would say, yes, I am practical. After all, he say, I, I, he would say, I am slaves to millions of things, uh, radios, frigidaires, automobiles, and I am a bohemian. I believe that things should be reduced to their absolute minimum. Long hair minimizes the need for a barber. <laughs> and when you go to sleep at night, night shirts, pajamas are not necessary if you have bed covers. Oh. And when you wear shoes, socks can be done without. After all, they only produce holes. Oh, did he really say that? <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, he was so cute. That's so nice to think of such an eminent person being so real, you know. And what I get from those little stories is that Einstein's willingness to see everything with fresh eyes is reflected in this willingness to see the whole cosmos that way. You know, it was so deeply embedded in him, uh, this capacity to see. We've been talking about that the last couple of shows, particularly about Carlos Castaneda and Don Juan. And Don Juan's gift to us was this encouragement to see beneath what seemed to be real into what was really more important and more significant to our lives. I'm encouraged that the show has been doing so well because I think this must be some reflection of perhaps the whole world's willingness to also take a new look. And I know that Ed's show has been playing to rave reviews and to standing room only Thank all you. over the place. No, no compliments, you know, this is just this stark truth. And I also know that he's been invited to do the show in a rather uh, significant places. Like for instance, this fall, he's going to be doing it for the Nobel laureates. And also he was recently at the Kennedy Center where he got support, I guess you'd say, from very unexpected quarters. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about that. Well, you know, it's one thing to be at the Kennedy Center and be invited there and do an Einstein show, but it's quite something else to have 
practically half of Congress come to the opening night sponsored by two nuclear freeze organizations, Peace Links and Ground Zero. It was a fundraiser benefit for those organizations headed by Betty Bumpers, the wife of Senator Dale Bumpers, and also by Senator Metzenbaum and his wife and other uh, senators and congressmen uh, from our own uh, area here, Anthony Bielinson. And I understand it was successful even on a financial level of raising $75,000 for these organizations. And I just felt terrific that I could present Einstein and what he had to say and how it fit in to the mode of the problems and, and things that those senators are dealing with today. Oh, I love the idea that we are not just playing partisan politics and that perhaps, you know, in our uh, deepest political uh, arenas, we are really willing to see also what an encouragement. I want now, though, to turn to Einstein himself and to find out from Ed, who knows so much, uh, what Einstein thought and said. And I wanted to start out with the big question, what was Einstein's perspective about God? Well, Suzanne, since there is so much you would like to know about Einstein, why don't you ask him? Ah, good idea. <laughs> So, Miss Taylor, here I am. Dr. Einstein, I presume? Yeah. <laughs> Charmed. <laughs> well, as I was asking, I grew up, as did most people, thinking of science and religion as quite opposite, in opposition, actually. And yet, here you are, the greatest scientist who ever lived, with a deeply religious feeling. So, how do you explain this? But people often ask me, do you believe in God? I tell them that I believe in a Spinoza's God, a God who reveals himself in the orderly harmony of what exists, not in a God who concerns himself with the faithful and actions of human beings. Ah, you mean you are thinking of God as a kind of a force and intelligence with which we must all harmonize, in which we all could be harmonized, rather than a kind of personal God who would be there to punish us or to answer our prayers, yes? Do you know what other scientists before me believed about the universe? Tell that me. what is out there was created by chance. But do you know what an inner voice told me? That E equal MC square may not be the total answer yet, but at the same time, God does not play dice with the universe. Well, this must be what you have incorporated into your obviously famous theory of relativity, which is some kind of map or blueprint of that idea, of that um, understanding. Is there any way that you could give some kind of simple ex explanation to the audience and to me about the theory of relativity? Miss Taylor. <laughs> if you would sit with me for one hour, I would guarantee you it would seem like a minute. But if you only sit for one minute on a hot stove, then that would seem like an hour. I think that is the simplest explanation I have ever come up with for the theory of relativity. Well, I gather that what that means is that you can't count on anything to be fixed, to be absolutely like you think it is. In other words, there are no absolutes and everything is relative, right? In other words, a fly walking on top of a moving train. The train is moving on the ground. The ground is rotating as the Earth. The Earth is revolving around the Sun. The Earth and Sun are moving through space as the whole solar system. All this motion becomes relative to where it is being observed. Well, that is the gist of the theory of relativity. If you would believe for one minute, Miss Taylor, that we are sitting here Yet we are moving through space at a high velocity that the very spots that we started to sit just a few minutes ago are many thousands of miles away than the very first spot we started to sit at the beginning. When that is where it is being observed by someone else in space. When that is the gist of the theory of relativity. Oh, I love it. You know, what that says to me is that Everything affects everything. 
Anything that does anything moves everything. So that it's a reminder to me and to all of us to absolutely be impeccable, to be real careful of how we do everything, because everything matters. Yes? What should be impeccable in the universe is the morality of each individual on how he relates to another person. That affects everybody. Where do you work out all this stuff? Where'd you come up with all of this? Where's your laboratory? Ah, this is my laboratory. But your instruments? The pen, the most powerful instrument in the universe. <laughs> well, I'm really starting to get it. Why my friend, Ed Metzger, who does this wonderful one-man show about you, calls it the practical bohemian. You sure don't do anything like anybody else. <laughs> in fact, I remember hearing stories about you that when you went to school, you were very different from the other students, that you were very um, out of it, so to speak. What was going on? When I was a little boy, the development of my speech was so slow, my mother thought I was going to be retarded. When as time went on, it looked as though she was right, for I did not speak a word for the first nine years of my life. I guess I had nothing to say. Oh, <laughs> well, what, do you have any opinions today about education? How do you think we're all doing? Throughout my school years, I had difficulty with every subject they gave me. You see, teachers never thought that I would amount to anything. I had trouble with geometry, the multiplication tables, geography, history dates. You see, I found it foolish to memorize what could be looked up in reference books. Well, that sort of makes sense. <laughs> that could save us a lot of effort, all of us. <laughs> I actually, however, have gone to a reference book. I went to the dictionary to Webster's, because I wanted to look up the definition of pacifism. Ah, I understand, good. yes, you have a reputation as a pacifist. Uh, and what Webster says is, pacifism is the policy of establishing and maintaining universally peaceful relations among all nations, so that all differences may be adjusted without recourse to war. What is uh, the story about you and pacifism? Well, I simply have aligned myself with many unpopular causes. The arrest and conviction of the Scottsboro Eight, the executions of Sacco and Vincetti and the Rosenbergs. I protested Japan's invasion of Manchuria. In fact, I am against all armed services throughout the world, as was Mahatma Gandhi. Well, I'd like you to explain to me how this all relates to your fathering the atomic bomb. No, no, no. I am not the father of the atomic bomb. There was a situation which existed in the world at that particular time that was untenable for me. At that particular time, I received word from Dr. Lisa Meitner, who was thrown out of Germany because she was Jewish, thank heavens that she was, that Hitler was starting to use my theories and formulas of mass conversion to energy for the development of an atomic weapon. You see, though, it was that type of, that type of uh, information that came to me that made me stand up and see that the free world would be in danger. But you did sign a letter to Roosevelt, which yeah. recommended that he actually go ahead and make an atomic weapon. I signed the letter that was delivered to President Roosevelt encouraging the United States to enter into the atomic age because there was no alternative when I thought that Hitler would possibly have such a devastating weapon. Where would the free world stand? What was an alternative? I came to agree reluctantly, though, that force can only be met by force. It is only now that I realize that the signing of that letter is the single most regrettable act I did in my life. And yet the fear that I had of Germany obtaining an atomic weapon was overbearing. Miss Taylor, if Germany was in the sole possession of an atomic weapon, or not anyone in the free world like the United States, what then? Well, what a dilemma, because I also see that what you did helped father the arms race. I would like to say that I believe in a one world government, in a universal humanity. What do I mean by that? 
There is no need for national boundaries. But I am practical. As long as there remains hatred and violence to people, then these national boundaries must serve as protective means for its citizens. As long as one nation thinks of going to war with another nation, there will always be armament, one side against the other, building up with one powerful weapon more than the other. We must trust ourselves to a one world government. Oh, you know, we talk about that all the time here in this household, where we call ourselves the Garden of Eden, where we are actually trying to live our lives in peace with one another. We talk about the fact that there isn't any way to win within the system that we're in now, that no matter how well we do it, we get caught in these dilemmas whereby we really are against one another, and that the only way to solve the problem is to actually create a whole different system, that within the system that we're in now, we will just go on creating more and more against this, more and more dilemma for ourselves. I agree with yes. you. I do not know who is willing to be brave enough to stand up in this world as it is today to say that we must have a universal humanity on a one world government and that all the weapons must be thrown into the ocean. Who will be brave enough to be the first nation to say that? Well, you're brave enough to be a person to say that. We're brave enough to be a show to say that. We keep inviting everybody to come and participate with us, everybody who understands these things, to add their voice. You know, I know that it's very difficult to say things with absoluteness, with relative absoluteness, that are unpopular, that are uh, against the flow, that it takes a peculiar kind of courage to say no to the prevailing ethic and to say it uh, with, with dimension, to say it with courage. I also know that you have said those things, you said those kinds of things all your life. You were not afraid. And I also gather that you were lonely. There was a certain loneliness to adopting these um, principles, these stands that were so different from everybody else's perspective. I have received every name under the sun for my thoughts along the political and philosophical lines. I still say that we must stand, everyone in the universe must stand for their right of morality. We cannot allow the politicians to dictate to us, especially to scientists that keep working on different projects, that their work is continuously used for destructive purposes instead of peaceful means. We as citizens must take the responsibility and stand up. Oh, you are a brave man. And were you were you lonely because of this? Do you have any history? I know I read that about you. Was it true? I, I have felt, I have felt in this particular part of my life, I have received from many men, like Bertrand and Russell, support that I needed to carry on my work. However, I do not mind being lonely. I would like to have all the people on the face of this earth to join me in the sense of a one world government. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that the kind of loneliness that comes from these um, positions that are so different from everybody else's, um, the loneliness is compensated for by an inner strength, by an inner knowing, by knowing that we are following these inner laws, by being in harmony in our own being, in our own knowing with all that there is. You know what I say about that, Miss Taylor? No. I believe, <laughs> I believe everyone must march and walk to their own clock with, with inside them. And I believe the way the human mind or the good nature of human beings are formed, that then we will have the morality or the peace on earth that we are looking for, not too much to another drama. Well, this would be consistent with seeing that it wasn't God outside yourself that was going to punish you for being um, bad, let's say, but that your drummer inside was God and that your satisfaction would come from being impeccable. That's what I mean by impeccable, and I know what you mean by impeccable also. Yes. I understand you. Yes, Mr. <laughs> you want to shake on it? Yes. Thank you. <laughs>
Oh, you are so beautiful. <laughs> would you come back and visit me again? I certainly do. <laughs> okay, what I would like you to do now, actually, however, um, I have a little treat here. I also went to another reference source and uh, went to the old Xerox machine and copied a letter, a letter that you wrote, which actually I'd like you to explain. This is one of the most beautiful things I've ever read. I'd like you to talk about it, and would you mind reading it? This is the letter to you the teenage like, girl. Well, yes. Ah, yeah, this letter is very old, 1931. I wrote this to a young lady who is my neighbor in Lake Kapus, Germany, outside of Berlin, when she wanted me to say something to her generation as a teenager when I wrote this letter. You would like me to read it? Oh, I'd love you to read it. It's so beautiful. <laughs> Dear Miss Wolf, O oh youth, do you know that yours is not the first generation to yearn for a life full of beauty and freedom? Do you know that all your ancestors felt as you do and fell victim to trouble and hatred? Do you know also that your fervent wishes can only find fulfillment if you succeed in attaining love and understanding of men and animals and plants and stars so that every joy becomes your joy? and every pain your pain. We are all connected and depend on each other. Open your eyes, your heart, your hands, and avoid the poison your forebears so greedily sucked in from history. Then will all the world be your fatherland, and all your work and effort spreads false blessings. Truly, A. Einstein. Amen. As the strains of Mozart fade, Mozart being Einstein's favorite, favorite for Mozart's precision, for his elegance, for his beauty, for his harmony, for his lack of excess, for his absolute perfection, qualities that Einstein appreciated and worked with in his work. As those strains fade and we pick up our birds and our airplanes here in my garden, I wanted to bring you out here for a little chat. And the first thing I wanted to chat about was any presumptuousness in my doing this. I am well aware that I am in the glow of a, of a brilliant spirit. Uh, and who am I now to hold center stage? Well, who am I? I'm here for a reason. If I didn't know it before, I learned it doing this Einstein show. I learned it even more deeply than I knew it before, which is the way our evolutionary process does work. I learned that what Einstein knew, I know also. Because there only is one knowing. Socrates knew it. Shakespeare knew it. Blake knew it. Whitman knew it. On and on. Well, not too many people from antiquity, but more and more now, who know what's going on, who know the difference between life and death. It's all very, very simple, uh, even though it may all seem very complex. You either know that life is about something meaningful and something eternal, or you think that it's about something ephemeral, something material. Once you know what there is to know, and once I know what there is to know, there is no greater knowing available to us. So Einstein perhaps had a language, did have a language. I, didn't, I don't have that language. He had a, a, a language that could communicate, a language that could inform. And yet that information is no more profound for Einstein than it is for me and than it is for you. I particularly wanted to have this chat around Einstein, however, because he is a particularly quintessential figure. Even though I know, he knows, Socrates knows, Einstein is a quintessential figure. He's a fulcrum. Before Einstein, it was possible to idly know. It was possible to wonder what to do with one's information. It was possible to speculate. It was possible to philosophize. It was possible to write beautiful works. Now, of course, all these things are possible today, but something new has come on the scene since Einstein, the threat of our destruction. 
it's no longer possible to be idle about this information. We have no time. We are in a corner. We are in the last corner. What shall we do? Whenever one gets to this door, to this door of perception, the question always arises, what next? Shakespeare wrote plays, etc. What next for us? We can't dawdle. Well, let's talk about Einstein perhaps as a bit of a model also. Here he is in this spot as fulcrum. How about as model? Einstein was a hero. He was a hero because he listened to his own drummer. Because he had the courage to speak a deeper truth than was popularly understood. We didn't speak quite enough on the show about that. You know, Einstein actually was in a lot of trouble all his life. Do you know he wasn't even invited to participate in the Manhattan Project, the development of atomic energy, because uh, there was a, a communist threat. He got caught in this world where we make rules, we make threats, we make war. And yet he belonged to a fraternity that knew better. He knew that science was greater than all of this misinformation, was greater than man's and human beings' uh, penchant for exclusion for against this. He called for a scientific fraternity that would be in union and in harmony in a, in a spot greater than the spot that governments, that, that more contracted and limited humankind carved out and identified. And he was very unpopular for doing it. It was a courageous stand. What then for us? Where is our heroism? What should courageous action be? I spoke in the show about calling for peace. Actually, I'd like to uh, address that more clearly. A call to peace these days is no great shakes. You know, it's become popular. In Einstein's day, Einstein was speaking heretical things. We were such a gung-ho, you know, militaristic country. But these days, to say, yay, peace, well, there's nothing wrong with it, of course, but is it the rightest thing we could be doing? I had what amounted to perhaps a mystical experience last week. It was a very, very deep insight. You know, Einstein said he got the theory of relativity from a feeling in his muscles. That was his clue. Well, I had a feeling in my being, and the feeling was that we were headed as a civilization for Armageddon, the way the Jews went to the showers. And the word was politely, much too politely. So that as we scream and holler for peace and as we carry our placards and do our respectable part as conscionable citizens, is that all we can do? Do we expect that to work? Do we expect to really be effective? And if not, what then? Well, I don't know the answers, but I live this question. And I suggest that that is what we could do we could turn our attention to living this question of what now? What then must we do, as Billy says in the year of living dangerously, in the face of a world full of lovelessness and full of betrayal? What then must we do? We must answer that question. Above and beyond all else, we must address ourselves to the future of this civilization. Einstein knew, and I know, that life is eternal. We go on. It does not end at the end of our physical life. We are responsible for all eternity. What shall we do with that responsibility? Einstein knew the only chance we have is to set our sights and to respond to each other in love. No greater advice from him, from Socrates, from Shakespeare, from anyone could be forthcoming for their times or for all time. Remember it. Join us every week as we trade this information for our survival and our glory. Have a good week. Bye.